الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد The last time the discussion moved from dhikr to fikr and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his essence is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's essence is not um, <clears throat> the the destination for our reflection because he is too beyond us however everything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is open to ibra is open to lessons is open to uh, reflection and that's essentially why he made the world and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly says in the Quran for people to look for people to observe for people to reflect and if a person just does that he'll be much closer to his fitrah he'll be just more closer to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be we get so engaged in the artificial world that dominates us makes us think in a particular way uh, makes about makes us think about certain things in a particular way about things in partic- in a particular way which is conducive to um, materialism which is conducive to just fulfilling our nafs as opposed to understanding where we're going one way is to look with a view to look at how things come and go in this world and thus reflect on how we're also going to come and go and then the question that arises is that if everything is perishing and we've seen other human beings perish and our forefathers are not alive they've also left then we're also going to perish so once we've understood we perish then the next question that arises is where do people go if they go to nowhere then why do they come into the world in the first place who set up this system in the first place so this kind of thought process we've never had to think that way for those people who've been born muslims they've never had to think this way you've been told what to believe and then as we grew up as we matured as we started thinking for ourselves we personalized that belief to a certain degree but i don't think that most people who are born muslims get to really think about it people who convert they probably think about this much more because they've had to they've had to make a massive paradigm shift so they have probably thought more about this whereas we've been told what to believe so in that sense we're at an advantage in one sense at least we got the basis those who are not converts but then the disadvantage is that we don't really think and really understand it so what the previous one said was meditation is the voyage of the heart in the domains of alterities that if you want to reflect your reflection should be on everything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alterities anything the aghiyar anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then in the next one he he says something very important he says al fikratu sirajul qalb fa idha dhahabat fala ida'ata lah that meditation is the lamp of the heart a meditation by meditation here al fikr it means to think فكر يفكر تفكير with your fikr with your imagination to think not in a fanciful way but with what's around you and what's happening trying to find correlations trying to find purpose not just correlation that's science you know just to understand empiricism that's just science but to find out why things occur that's philosophizing right so in that sense we have to infuse that with our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how does it all come together that is the way the heart will remain illumined so that's what he says says meditation which he i mean it could be reflection meditation thinking deeply is the lamp of the heart and when we say meditation meditation generally gives us this understanding in the world of this monk who is sitting down and you know doing some kind of muraqaba you know that but it's more than that we're only doing muraqaba the way we do because we don't have fikr all the time so we're forced to do it in a particular way so that that be, that's a training for us to be thinking like that all the time because the whole point of wuquf qalbi uh, which is the fifth point is 
the, the, the objective is the wukuf qalbi. But because we're not in tune with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most of the time, which we should be, we're having to do it sometimes. Whereas really a believer should be constantly connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the veil should only come down once in a while when we do a sin. Because you can only do a sin when you don't think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala watching you and that consciousness is not strong enough. So if that, const- uh, if that thought, that consciousness is strong enough, we'll never commit a sin. So if we could be thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time, then there's no way you would, you know, it'd be very difficult to commit a sin. Then you'd have to really just phase out for a while. Right now, it's the other way around where most of the time we don't think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We force ourselves to think about Him. And that is a challenge. The most difficult, I mean, you, you, you know, you, you get this, um, this is the problem that most murids have, is that I do everything else. It's just a muraqaba stuff and the muraqaba is going to be tough because it's a burden on the heart. It's a burden on the nafs. With everything else, you can do it. And you feel good about it, you may have got reward for it, but you didn't really get closeness with it because we didn't concentrate. The fikr was not there. The concentration wasn't there. For a muraqaba, you can't deceive yourself. So you know if you have to sit, you're going to have to sit properly. So then we leave it off, we leave it off, we leave it off. Everything else we'll just do because it's something we can do while distracted. But you can't do muraqaba while distracted and still feel like we've, we're successful in our muraqaba. So, if we can overcome that challenge, inshallah, if we can overcome that challenge of being able to think mostly about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than anything else, then I think that is a success story here. So he says, a meditation is the lamp of the heart, so when it goes away, the heart has no illumination. And this is an expert being like, okay, who are you to say that? Well, you know, he's had the experience and he's speaking on behalf of many people and the experiences and... That's what's accepted. This aphorism means that bereft of meditation, the heart resembles a dark room in which there's no light giving lamp. One does not know what lurks in that dark room as nothing is visible. Similarly, without meditation, the reality and true nature of an object will not be fathomed. So then we'll just see that what others want to make us see. We'll only see what shaitan wants us to see of an outside object. And in fact, we'll only see those objects. When man meditates the inner nature and reality of things will be revealed to him, he will see with open eyes, meaning his spiritual eyes, the realities of truth, falsehood, the perishable nature of this world and the everlasting nature of the hereafter. The glory, splendor, power and wrath of Allah, as well as his being the true benefactor, will become vivid realities. Man will also become aware of his own hidden defects, the scheme and deception of his ego and the world being the abode of futility and deception. If the servant refrains from meditation, his heart will become like a dark room. He will then be unable to differentiate the various things that are outlined above. Then he moves on and he talks about different types of fikr. He says, Al-fikratu fikratani. Fikratu tasdiqin wa imanin wa fikratu shuhudin wa ayanin or wa ayanin. فالأولى لأرباب الاعتبار والثانية لأرباب الشهود والاستبصار. Meditation is of two kinds. Two kinds of meditation: the meditation of belief and faith, and the meditation of contemplation and vision. The first is for the adepts of reflective thought. Those people who know how to think, who have advanced in this regard, and the second is for the adepts of contemplation and intellectual vision. We need some commentary here. So he says, the select servants of Allah are of two kinds. Now, this will have to be listened to carefully because this is of the more advanced level of um, this discussion. The select servants of Allah are of two kinds. The travelers to Allah, who is the salik. Salaka yasluku means to take on a path. Maslak. Maslak is a path. And they also use it in an abstract sense, maslak, as a way of thinking, a school of thought, a perspective, an ideology. So that's a maslak. And salak means to take the path and salik means the one who takes the path, the traveler. So one is the select, the select servants of Allah are of two kinds, the traveler to Allah. And number two, the 
ecstatic, who is the majdub. Now, majdub is, a, he, he'll explain what that means, but many of you have heard of majdubs. Majdub is a, somebody who is, who is in the state of vision more than he is in this world. And sometimes they do strange things. But I'll, I'll let the book explain itself. You've heard the word Madhub often, right? It's never been defined generally. It's just he's a Madhub or he was a Madhub. For example, right now in Raipur, which is um, this uh, amazing small place in the UP in India. I've actually visited the place and you won't feel that kind of calmness anyway because for about 40 to 50 years it's constantly had dhikr and probably nothing much more than that going on there it's like just a khanqa it's just a retreat it's been since Maulana Abdul Rahim Raipuri and then Maulana Abdul Qadir Raipuri and then after that there's right now there's Mufti Abdul Qayyum Mufti Abdul Qayyum was in Saharanpur initially as one of the high-level teachers of logic and philosophy and things like that. And then he moved out and went to this Khanqa and became the main sheikh of the Khanqa. And I met him at that time when he was okay. But now they say that he is just constantly in dhikr. Like he doesn't know what's going on anywhere else. So one is somebody who's in dhikr and who still, you know, he takes time, he does dhikr, they have dhikr majalis, etc. But he is constantly in Allah, Allah. That's all he's doing. And he, he's just not aware of what's going on around him, apparently. Or, you know, we don't know what, what's going on in their mind, but this section will actually give us some understanding of what's going on here. Right? So you have people like that. Some of these people will just wander the streets. They'll, they'll just be totally, you know. And there are certain things about them. The one who... It's not a state that you want to aspire to, by the way. It's not a state you want to aspire to. It's a state that's placed on you. It's not one you want to try to get into. It's not one of those objectives. That's what you have to remember. It's just that if it happens, then this is just telling us what's going on. Do you understand? The one who logically deduces the cause from the effect is a traveler. He's looking at the apparent um, correlations between things, causations, apparent causation, not real causation. He meditates on the effects and arrives at the knowledge of the cause. That's what we generally do. That's what we're trying to do. Looking around us and trying to get back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with everything. His heart initially wanders in the objects of creation. Everything around you. From the car, the tree to the mountains. From these meditations he reaches the way to the divine attributes. So you see the divine attributes in action whenever you see any of these things. And then what happens, for example, he sees people transgressing without Allah Most High punishing them. And from this, the traveler appreciates Allah's attribute of patience. That is supposed to remind us of Allah's patience, his ilm, his forbearance, his clemency. Where he refrains from punishing despite having the power. That's supposed to calm us down as well and not make us of those who are constantly aggressively trying to avenge people. And then, moreover, from the beauty, excellence, and perfection of objects, he infers that Allah is all-wise. By means of prolonged meditation on the names and attributes of Allah, the heart finally <clears throat> discovers the way leading to Allah Himself. So right now, the meditation that we're doing is on the name of Allah itself, just so that our heart becomes accustomed to the name of Allah. We're not yet meditating on Allah Himself. There's a difference. We're just meditating on the ismullah, which is a means to Allah, going from the name to the named. right? But here he's talking about also doing fikr around us and the higher levels of um, the higher levels of the Naqshbandi path, the lessons, they also, that's what it will get to. It'll do fikr on different things. They'll be telling you to do fikr on different things. But first, you have to get the heart accustomed to Allah himself first before you can start doing fikr. So you can't jump into fikr, it's going to be very difficult to think like that because we won't see behind the... Yeah, you can keep trying. 
by means of prolonged meditation on the names and attributes of Allah, the heart finally discovers the way leading to Allah Himself. Thus, by meditating on the effects, he ultimately reaches the cause, Allah Most High. On the other hand, the one who acknowledges effects after meditating on the cause, right? So the majzub does it opposite. The majzub thinks in the opposite way. The one who acknowledges effects after meditating on the cause, not cause to effect, but sorry, yeah, he goes from cause to effect. Yeah, after meditating on the cause, they go to effect. We go from the effect to the cause. But he goes from the effect to the cause. Now you do some dhikr, but that's what you, you just become totally drowned in the cause. And then from that you go to the effect. Initially his heart becomes imbued with the spiritual per uh, per perception, figuratively speaking, of the being. He becomes meaning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of the that of Allah. He becomes, he starts to perceive the that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll only understand this theoretically. It's not something you experience, so it's going to be difficult to understand it on a very realistic sense, only as much as the theory will allow us. He then dwells in the names and attributes of Allah. So he gets to the, the that of Allah first because of the immense amount of dhikr that they're doing generally. And then he starts to think of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Finally, he enters into meditating on creation. So it's the other way around. Right? Thus the traveler, who in the Salik, is taken from the bottom to the top, so as to speak, from the effects to the cause. And the ecstatic, the madhub, is brought down from the top to the bottom. However, this is the state of those whose perfection Allah Most High desires. Allah gives that to just certain individuals if he feels like it. But it's very seldom. It, 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 there are very few people like that. However, this is, yeah, um, since some of these attracted ones remain in the state of jadab, attraction, because jadab means to be pulled, jadaba means to pull. So it's a state of attraction. It's like a spontaneous, involuntary pull towards something. That's what jadab means. Uh, a magnet is, does jadab. Right, so it soaks up, it pulls towards you. So that's that's where maj, madhub comes from, the ecstatic who's been pulled to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So this is the state of those whose perfection Allah Most High desires. Since some of these attracted ones remain in the state of attraction, while some travelers remain suspended without attaining com accomplishment. So what you could have is you could have some people who will not go from that state of jadab and come out of it. They'll stay there. They won't come out of it. They won't come to the other level. They just stay within that realm. Whereas you've got many saliks who, who are who, like us who go from this way that we will never get to the top. We'll just stay here for some reason. We'll just stay, never get to the that, but just stay on the sifat. The Shaykh rahimahullah then says that there are two kinds of meditation. The first form is known as belief and faith. While the second is contemplation and vision. Now, that doesn't really explain much but let's let's carry on in the first kind of meditation the traveler uh, the travelers reach the knowledge of Allah by their meditative study of his creative objects right which we explain you get to Allah by thinking about the objects around you they utilize their physical senses eyes etc in the observation of creatures to conclude the greatness of the creator the aim of this meditation is the spiritual perception, mushahada, of the pure being of Allah Most High. That is what we want at the end of it, to have mushahada of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That doesn't mean a physical vision, it means a spiritual vision of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Its motivating forces is only the belief, because progression in, is not, in this sense, essentially from the creator to the creation. So if I'm to understand this, this means that it's only the belief that this can happen or that this exists, that we go that way. Because otherwise we're going to a higher realm, is very difficult. But in this case, the progression as to speak is from the creation to the creator. Thus the gaze of the traveler's heart in this state is more focused, concentrated on creation than ultimately on the creator. On the other hand, I'll probably understand it better when you hear the opposing situation. On the other hand, the knowledge possessed by the ecstatic 
dictates to him the reality of the existence of creation on account of the existence of the creator. That because he's a creator and he's understood the creator, he will understood now, he'll understand now that there has to be creation. So he goes the other way. The focus of his heart is initially on the creator, later reaching creation. For this reason, the traveler is one, the traveler, the salik, is the one whose sense and intellect are intact because he's constantly thinking. He's not um, drowned in that vision. Whereas the ecstatic acts generally in con conflict with customary intelligence. You'll see the majdub acting strange. He won't be acting in perceptible ways, in normal ways that you're used to. He'll be doing strange things because his senses are not, his senses have been overcome by his istighraq in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day, uh, when in my first hajj, I was with uh, a Singaporean uh, brother and he understands that area quite well and we used to, you know, there's a number of Indonesian, Malaysian people that you, you walk through, so he, you know, he has some affinity to them. And then he's telling me, he says, you know, he brought this up, he says that you've got some of these strange people, right? They look very strange, they, they like to kind of out of the ordinary. If you try to go and bother, you know, some people might have a bit of mischief and they go and start to bother them. And if they make dua for you, you've had it. So don't bother people like that. People who act a bit strange sometimes, don't bother people like that. You don't know what their state is. Unless the person is absolutely totally crazy and you know that. He's got no deen whatsoever. But somebody who's had the deen and then he becomes a bit, you can say, just inward looking as opposed to, he doesn't do things in a rational way, start saying a few things. Then be careful. You don't want to bother these people as well. Why should you bother anybody anyway? Unfortunately now YouTube is all taken up by doing pranks. That's what gives you the, that's what gives you hits nowadays. That's what makes you celebrities, to go and do a few pranks, just bother people, just um, do crazy things in different places. And that's what gets you. So you touch one of these people and you'll see what happened. You know? uh, that's why the hadith of Muslim now comes into perspective, where the Prophet ﷺ said that, uh, Which means that there are a number of um, individuals that are totally disheveled in their appearance their, their hair is all over the place their clothes are soiled and they look like nothing um, from ghubar but they're so close to Allah because I'm assuming they're in this state if they swore an oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that something will happen it will definitely happen Allah will fulfill that oath for them they say wallahi it's gonna rain tonight wallahi you're gonna you know You'll see what happens. And that's it. Right? So one has to be very, very careful with these kind of things. It's a good job we don't see many of these people around, you know, because it's not it's a state that Allah places some people in. Of course, this world they'll be treated as strange, weird, whatever. Hazrat Mullah Yusuf Sawa Sheikh, his father became like this. For years, 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 he would he was just there doing dhikr in his house. And I mean, he'd call, he'd speak to us once in a while or something. It's just totally like that. To such a degree that the, the people of the village, they, they forced him to divorce his wife. Because he was just somewhere else. So then she, uh, Mona Yusuf's uh, mother was divorced and then you know, she went to South Africa, married again, and um, had a number of children there and from this uh, the, 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 the first father the father Mala Yusuf and Mala Dreams are two and their, their life was quite interesting as well in the sense that they couldn't have children first the parents could not have children and some pious guy a pious person came along and when they d discussed with him that this is our state he gave them a ring and that's it he gave them a ring and then after that the older brother, Mawlana Abdurrahim, uh, Rahimahullah, has passed away now. He was born. So, kind of very interesting. And uh, our husband, Mawlana Yusuf, is actually very introverted as well. He probably has more of an effect of his father on there. He's not a Madzub, for sure. He's not. But he's definitely very introverted. He's not into public discourse and, you know, sitting around meeting too many people. And that. that's, that's, that's his state. It's, a, it's, a, it, it's just, I mean, this just helps us to understand when, we, when you hear the stories of the pious, you'll hear about individuals like this. And there'll be a number, a number of them. 
So th there's a doctor, there's a doctor uh, from, uh, Indian doctor from Dubai or something like that. He went to visit this Mufti Abdul Qayyum a few weeks ago. And he said that he was given access to him as a doctor. So he was very lucky, you know, to do certain ch checkups or whatever, uh, medically, you know, whatever. Otherwise, it's very difficult to, and I think what he said is that, and what's, what's very interesting is that when certain individuals come, they come out of it. So what he said was that, the, I forget the name of the other pious person who came to visit him. And when he came to visit him, he actually spoke to him to a certain degree. But other than that, that's it. He's just in his world and after that. So again, it's not something to hope for. But if Allah puts you in there, it's a different story. It's not something that you want to hope for. It should be understood, he finally says, that the knowledge derived from both these types of meditation is inspired. It is the bestowal from Allah Most High. At the end of the day, everything comes from Allah, whichever way a person is coming. Now, the other thing that you have to remember here is that how do you know what to do in these situations? So whether you're in a state of jal, or whether you're in a state of suluk, what? How do you know what to do? What's next? What do you think the answer to that is? It, it, well, you need a shaykh. That, that's, that's why you need a shaykh in this path. Because the path is something unknown to us. And if you start trekking yourself, you know, the, the, the higher levels of this path, and you start seeing the experiences, it, this is where you could get misguided if... You don't have a shaykh, or if you don't have um, a, uh, what would you call it? You could get it. You don't, it's not necessary, but it could be because there's so many other mitigating, you know, factors or influential factors. There are many people who've never, probably never had a shaykh, but they're so close to the Quran or whatever, and they've just kept it very straight, but they've never had that fitna around them. And likewise, the madhub. The shaykh has to deal with the madhub in a particular way. Okay, let's just um, quickly do one one more here, because that was on a very high level. But did did most did you un, did you understand the two types of people here? And before this, I'd, uh, before I read this when I was a long time ago, I'd never bothered looking at it. Just heard madhu madhu, and now uh, after you know after I would read this, that's when I got an understanding that it's somebody who's on the path the other way round. It's coming top down and we're trying to go bottom up. Uh, he says, uh, this is on abstinence. Now he says, مَا قَلَّ عَمَلٌ بَرَزَ مِنْ قَلْبٍ زَاهِدٍ وَلَا كَثُرَ عَمَلٌ بَرَزَ مِنْ قَلْبٍ رَاغِبٍ No deed arising from a renouncing heart is small. No deed arising from an ascetic heart, a renouncing heart, a renouncing of the world heart is small. And no deed arising from an avaricious heart is fruitful. Just thinking over that just tells us our state and the difference in the Sahaba. When the dunya is not in your heart, then any deed you do is going to be just so much wholesome, more wholesome and rich. And if it's a greedy heart, then that greed of the heart will adulterate that deed. So even though it seems like we're doing it for Allah, but we'll have too many other motives. You know, like a good businessman, person who sees opportunities, who can make money at every... He's, he's, he's constantly under thought. Uh, a friend of mine, one of my classmates actually, he's been on my case for a, a few weeks. Because he wants me to join the AMC. Is it the AMC? Or ANC, what's it called? Or ACM? That... ACN, right? I've been hearing about it for over a year. I've heard lots of people have made money, but I've just had some bad experiences with shares and stuff like that. So I've just decided I don't have the time for this. Now, he's one who takes opportunities. He's seen people make money, so he's getting into it. A bit, a bit late, but he's getting into it. Now, he's on my case. And I'm saying, well, I don't have time to speak to you now. I don't have time to speak to you now, right? I, I'll send you somebody. I'll, I'll send you... Um, Somebody who can give you a demonstration and everything like that because there's a whole scheme that the way it works. Finally, I said, look, I've just given up a number of things. I've just given up Cambridge. I've given up my imamat. I've given up a number of things because 
I felt that they were distracting me in what I want to do in life, which is I want to be writing and teaching. And now, I know that this thing, if you want to make money through this thing, you have to put effort in it. You have to contact people. What another person told me is that, who's in Tablig, Jamaat, he says that I've seen some of our Tablighi brothers who've gotten into this. And the problem is that every time you sit down, you know, in Tablig, it's a social kind of, you know, movement, isn't it? So that's a big potential because you can recruit people through, through that. You know, can you, can you get into it? Can you pay this much? Can you get your electricity changed to this company and so on and so forth? Because they just become consumed by that fact. Because when you're doing that, the problem with AMC or whatever it's called is that it's very difficult then for you to differentiate between business and normal life. Because you'll be visiting friends, social visit, and you'll start talking about it. Nothing wrong with it really. But if that's constantly on your mind, I think it's very detrimental for the path. Yes, if you've got no money, and that's a way to make money for you, and you can manage your time, then that's fine, alhamdulillah. But if you're already doing many things, and that's going to take up your extra time, because it actually requires you calling people and speaking to them, that's the way you're going to make customers. It's not going to happen just like that. You put your money in, you're not going to get anything out of it unless you start recruiting people. So I explained to him, I said, look, I've just given up everything. And I know if I get into this, I'll have to do it properly, because I like to do things properly if I get into them. And then it will waste a lot of my time that I've just tried to free up. So then he says, okay, okay, fine. You know, I'm glad I had that discussion with him. Otherwise, it was very awkward that every time he'd call me, I'd try to avoid what he's saying because I don't want to get into it. But I think I finally did my istikhara in a sense. You know, Allahumma khidli wa and said, look, I don't want to get into this. Allah, gives you, Allah will provide money from other means. There's no need to do this. You know? But that's what business a certain business sense does to you, especially if you're a very good businessman, that's all you'll be thinking about. It's very difficult not to think about it because you see opportunities everywhere. I went with one brother who's into properties and as we're driving, that's all he's seeing. This property, oh, that property's gone now. This one, and this one, it's been developed by somebody. He's made six apartments in there and this is how much he's going to make. He can give you an assessment of every property that you pass. Because that's what they're into. So if you seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He becomes your main business, then that's what you will be seeing around you. But that doesn't mean you can't do anything else. It means that, you know, obviously, that is the main purpose in your life. That's what you're seeing. But then, you know, you are taking time. Right now, something else is the main purpose of our life. We have to take time out for Allah. So then he says, uh, as long as love for the world and love for fame dominates, sincerity in action will not develop. Simple as that. Worldly motives and lustful desires will appear in every place and in every deed of such a person. You'll start seeing money everywhere. You'll start seeing fame everywhere. You'll start seeing making a name for yourself everywhere. That's what it is. That's the problem with this. Acceptance of deeds in the divine court occurs only when those deeds are devoid of such calamities. Ya Allah. On the contrary, the servant, servants upon whom Allah's grace settles and whose egos are purified from love of the world, all their actions, whether pertaining to the religion or, or the world, are then based on sincerity. So it's not to say that the person will become zero in the world, no. The person could be wealthy in this world as well, but their heart is still with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The aim of such a person is solely Allah because the world has been expelled from his heart, hence a deed rendered by an abstinent one is not insignificant even if in quantity it appears slight. Although, uh, all, although his deed may be quantitatively little, it is imbued with a true spirit and is accepted by Allah Most High. Consequently, it is very significant. On the other hand, the actions of a man whose heart is greedily set on the world and who is forgetful of Allah Most High are insignificant, even if in appearance they are considered considerable and great. This is because the aim of these deeds is not proper. Such a heart is contaminated with falsehood. Therefore his deeds are not free of the calamities of show and base motives of ego and the devil, even if he considers himself to be free of such ailments. Considering ourselves to be free of it is not good enough. It's actually to be free of it. And this is what they say is generally going to have what you can learn from a shaykh. Because you allowed yourself to be criticized. You've allowed yourself, we've allowed ourselves to say, you tell us what to do. But the Shaykh's only going to be able to say it if you talk to him and tell him and communicate with him. 
It is of utmost importance to clean, cleanse the heart of all things besides Allah Most High. The heart should be purified and adorned with lofty attributes so that the righteous deeds rendered are full of life and soul. Then even if the deed is ostensibly small, in reality it will be great. It is essential to understand a righteous deed should not be abandoned. So this doesn't mean you abandon your righteous deeds if you don't think you have ikhlas. Right? On account of the existence of these spiritual calamities in one. After all, rendering the deeds is better than abandoning them. Moreover, righteous deeds, if practiced constantly, will ultimately produce sincerity. Because you eventually start thinking it's not worth it. You, you, feel the pre, you, know, you feel the fame, you've heard, you know, you've seen everything, or you haven't seen anything, forget that. Let's just focus on the, uh, on, on the deed itself. So it has to be learnt. But this, what this underscores for us is that sincerity is so important. It's actually more important in a sense than just doing lots of deeds. But then you can't generally get to sincerity without doing a lot of deeds. So it's the perspective that has to be corrected. Allahumma inda salam wa inda salam tabarati ya adhul jalali wa ikram. Allahumma ya hayu ya qayyum wa rahmatika la staghith. Allahumma ya hannam ya mandan la ilaha illa anta subhanaka illa kunna min al-zalimin. Jazallahu anna muhammadan ma huwa ahlu. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala sayyidina muhammad wa barik wa sallim. الحمد لله العلي الأعلى الوهاب اللهم يا حي يا قيوم رحمتك نستغيث أو الله أكسبت هو دعاس أو الله أكسبت هو جاذري أو الله أو الله we make we try to make this a gathering of ذكر أو الله make it truly so in your sight أو الله make it truly so in your sight أو الله accept it أو الله accept it أو الله accept the small meager amounts of Remembrance and the discussion that we have about you, O oh Allah, O oh Allah, grant us all sincerity in our hearts, grant us all sincerity in our hearts. Remove the attraction of the dunya from our hearts, O oh Allah, remove the attraction of the world and the dunya from our hearts. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, we ask that you purify our hearts, you make them how you want them to be. O oh Allah, we ask that you turn our hearts the way you want them to be. O oh Allah, that you remove all of the bad diseases that we have. O oh Allah, all the bad habits that we have. O oh Allah, everything that we have a desire for that is contrary to your desire. O oh Allah, we ask that you remove it from us. That you make it hated in our heart. You make it despicable in our heart. And you allow us to stay away from it. O oh Allah, make it easy for us to stay away from these things. O oh Allah, facilitate. O oh Allah, facilitate our aversion of these things. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, this is the struggle that we have. We're constantly looking at other than you. We're constantly engrossed in the world of alterity. So Allah, O oh Allah, we ask that you grant us just focus on you. And pure, we all have a challenge. We all have a different challenge, whatever that may be. O oh Allah, we ask that you allow us to overcome our challenges. Overcome our challenges. O oh Allah, grab us by the forelock and enter us into Jannah. Put us onto the right path. Put us onto the path of fikr and contemplation, meditation, remembrance. Oh Allah, oh Allah. We ask that you make us of those who constantly and frequently remember you. Oh Allah, and whose, whose dominant state is of remembrance to you. Oh Allah, right now we have to struggle to remember you. We find it difficult to do and sit down for our muraqabat. Time becomes so long and we feel that it takes so long. O oh Allah, and when we're doing useless activities, we can spend hours doing them and it seems so easy. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, O oh Allah, this is the struggle of this world. This is what you're going to test us for. This is how you're testing us and this is what you're going to judge us by. O oh Allah, we ask that you deal with us with your mercy as your mercy has dominated your anger. O oh Allah, we ask that you deal with us with your mercy. O oh Allah, that you're merciful to us, you're compassionate to us. O oh Allah, remove our, both our physical ailments and our spiritual ailments and those who, are, who have requested us to make dua, who have hopes in us to make dua, O oh Allah, grant them. Grant them their permissible desires and needs and make that easy for them. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, grant us ease in this dunya and success in this world and the hereafter. Grant us Jannatul Firdaus. Make the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam happy and happy with us in the hereafter, and allow us to drink from his hands. Allow us to drink from his hands. Oh Allah, this is the month of Rabiul Awal. Many people will be speaking about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Give us the tawfiq to really imbibe his character and become closer to him with all of these discussions and bayans and lectures that will take place. 
Oh Allah, make this a yearly progression for us. That every month of the year we're constantly thinking of our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh Allah, grant us his company in the hereafter. And make the best days of our existence the day that we stand in front of you. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillah.